welcome everyone. Um, this is our interviewing, putting your best foot forward um, workshop, part of our Rock Your Career series for fall. It's actually the, the last one in our series for this fall um, in our career skills series. So we're glad that you, you're you here. We're also recording. I know some of you will be watching this in the recording as well. So um, my name is Joan Marceau. I am the um, internship and career coordinator for Rockefeller College. And also with me today is Leslie Fuentes, who's one of our graduate assistants. Um, so we're a small group, so feel free. Um, if you've got questions as we're going through, I, I do have some PowerPoint slides. I'll be walking us through um, a variety variety of tips around interviewing and um, putting your best foot forward when you're interviewing. Um, but if you've got questions, feel free to either type them into the chat or use the raise your hand function and we can call on you and have you ask your questions out loud too. So, um, and feel free to, um, you know, ask questions as we go along and Leslie, you can, you know, if they're relevant to what we're talking about right then, just interrupt me and we can address them right now. And if they're other questions, um, we can save other questions till the end if we don't get to that topic as well. So, um, so welcome everybody. Let's go ahead. I'm going to share my screen and um, we will dive right in. So, um, so really, I'm, I thought I'd start with just a few quick tips. Um, uh, I think when you think about interviewing, it's probably a stressful thing for many people. Um, but think about um, just your positive attitude makes a big difference. Um, making that good first impression, um, treating everyone with respect. Um, as you, you know, go into an office for an interview or things like that, um, showing your enthusiasm is, I think, an important thing that um, energy comes through in an interview, whether it be on Zoom or a phone interview or in person. Um, staying calm, I can get really stressful. So just trying to, you know, do that deep breathing and staying calm. And then you want to be yourself, but you want to be your best self. So really, as you're thinking about, um, you know, and going through an interview, it, an interview really is a two-way conversation to help you find out if this is the the best, a good fit for you as a potential job or internship. And it's a, it's also an opportunity for them to find out if you're a good fit in terms of being an employee or an intern. So um, being yourself is really important. You want to be your best self, of course, um, but being yourself is an important part of it because the, the, the uh, final um, decision uh, is really about both the employer and the um, interviewee um, making sure that it's a good fit for both parties. So um, let's start a little bit. I think it's always helpful if you guys want to just share. Um, it's helpful for me to know just a little bit about your experience. So you can share this in the chat, type it in the chat, or like I said, unmute yourself. What are your best interview tips? Any tips from your own experience? And Leslie, if you have any, you can feel free to share too. Um, what are your best interview tips? Lizzie, you can just go ahead and read that from the chat if you want to. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, be prepared with questions to ask the employer. Yes, that's a great one. Being prepared with questions to ask the employer. Excellent. Any other tips that anyone has from your own experience? What about what makes you nervous about interviews? What stresses you out and makes you the most nervous about interviews? Um, probably like group interviews where you're being interviewed by several people. Yeah, I think that, I think that you're right. That's more stressful. There's several people that you're talking to um, and it can be more stressful. Um, but I think one of the things that I actually have to say that I find nice about a group interview is that sometimes it's hard to connect with the person if you don't really connect with the interviewer if there's multiple people you've got a better chance of feeling like a connection to one of them so i think that can be a positive side of that but and i think it really is you know in the long run you're talking to a lot of people but it's really um they're still going to be asking you questions so the experience itself um, isn't that much different. Um, it seems scarier, but I think if you can, you know, just remind yourself, it's not that much different. Um, anything else that makes you nervous? 
What about what questions do you have about interviewing? I want to be sure that we answer any specific questions that people have about interviewing um, as we go through the presentation. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead, and if you've got additional questions, feel free to just type them into the chat as we're going along. So I want to talk a little bit about interview formats. Um, I mean, obviously, in-person interviews, traditionally the most common type of interview, um, but since COVID, virtual interviews have become much, um, much more frequent as well. They're often um, common as a first round interview, if it's going to be a couple of rounds, or if you're interviewing for out of, you know, out of the area, out of state positions, virtual interviews have become very popular. Um, telephone interviews, still something um, used for screening or first round interviews as well, um, probably becoming less popular now that um, virtual interviews have, you know, become much more commonplace. Um, but still telephone is something that you may come across from time to time. And a unique one that's not really common, but is starting to be used by larger organizations is a recorded video interview, um, which is similar to like a virtual interview, but instead of being live with the person on Zoom or whatever, it's a recorded video. So um, it's a little bit um, disconcerting, I think. I've had some students who've done those, but just keep in mind that it's, you know, many of the things that we talk about with other um, interview techniques and virtual interviews will apply as well, just that you'll be recording it and not, um, you'll hear the recording of the, you know, question and then you'll record your answer. And so you don't get that kind of dynamic play back and forth. So um, something just to keep in mind. So questions about any of those things. All right, so we're going to talk about what to do before the interview to prepare, things to do during the interview, and then what to do after the interview. So that's kind of the structure we're going to go with. Um, before the interview, you want to do your research, assess your skills and experiences, prepare questions, which um, one of the um, students already mentioned, practice your elevator pitch, um, and um, we've got some additional tips for video interviews as well. So um, let's kind of go through each of those with a little more detail. So doing your research. So, you know, probably you've done some research when you apply to the job initially, but if you get offered an interview, it's time to go a little bit more in depth on that research. Um, you want to be sure when you're applying to things, save those position descriptions, download it and save it. Don't just save the link. Sometimes the po job posting is gone by the time you get offered an interview. So you want to be sure you have that information. If there was anything else that you, you know, materials you had from when you applied, you want to save those things so you've got access to that. And you want to spend some time research, researching the organization or agency, the interviewers, and the position. In terms of the organization, things like going to their website, reading other articles or reviews, commentary, um, especially if it's a controversial organization or there's been any scandal or controversy with the organization, you can check to see what other people are saying about them as well. And find them on social media, um, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, find um, what um, they're putting out there about themselves as well as other people, what other people are saying about them. In terms of the interviewers, um, typically um, they may tell you who you'll be interviewing with. If they don't, you certainly can ask. That's a perfectly acceptable thing as you're emailing back and forth to make the arrangements for the interview. You can ask who will I, will I be interviewing with. It helps you know if it's gonna be one person or multiple people as well. But then if once you have their names, you can look them up. Um, find out a little bit more about them, you know, what is their role in the organization, um, look them up on LinkedIn, see if they've written any blogs or articles, find out what, um, you know, kind of things they're interested in, in terms of their role in the organization. It just helps with that kind of um, making a connection with them and um, helping you formulate questions to ask as well. Um, and then the position, you really want to review that position description, um, find if you can find out if there's people who held the position previously by searching on LinkedIn, or maybe it's an internship that you're familiar with, and there's other students maybe who did that internship last year that you can talk to, um, or just finding other people online who have similar titles just to learn more about what those types of positions are like. All of those things can really help you um, prepare for the interview. So questions about doing research. 
So then what you want to do, so you've researched, you've kind of got the information about the, um, uh, the organization, and now you want to assess your skills and experiences. And you probably did this when you were writing your cover letter and sending in your resume to apply initially. But again, an interview is going to be longer. A cover letter is one page, a resume is one page, an interview Typically, it's going to be 20 minutes to an hour. Sometimes for full-time positions, there could even be multiple interviews, and it might be more than more time than that. So you're going to have to have a lot more to talk about. So you really want to study that position description. And the key things to look for in the position description, that opening paragraph that kind of describes the position or the organization is, is helpful, gives you some background. That list of job duties or responsibilities is crucial. And then usually there will be required qualifications and preferred qualifications. And what you want to do is with all of those things is you want to then match your skills to that job description. So just taking an Excel spreadsheet, a Word document, and breaking apart all of those duties and responsibilities, those preferred and required qualifications, and making a list of them, and then matching your skills to that. So on that document, make yourself a little outline where you think about specific examples of times you've done that. So if you've got a question about one of those things, what's an example of something that you could talk about? So if they're looking for research um, skills, maybe you've got an example or two from classes, some research projects that you did. Maybe you did some research work in a previous internship or something like that. So think of specific examples of times that you've demonstrated each of those job duties, each of those skills that they're looking for. And just prepare this whole document. You don't have to write out whole answers, but make yourself an outline that really kind of enumerates those. So then you can study that. And when you get to the interview, if they ask a question about that, you don't have to think, oh, what is a, what's the best example of research? You've already thought about two or three examples. And I would recommend having a couple of examples of each um, thing because when you're interviewing, maybe you've already talked a lot about, you know, classroom examples. And so they ask a similar question and you might, maybe I should give an example from a different internship this time or something like that. So having multiple um, examples for each one will make it easier um, as you're going through the interview. So questions about any of that? Oh, where can you pull examples from? I started alluding to that, but you can get examples from obviously your academics, class um, papers, ex um, projects, presentations, extracurricular or volunteer activities you've done, internships, summer jobs, other work experiences, hobbies, just sometimes general life. You may have some experiences that might be relevant to some of those skills or um, things they're looking for. And don't forget about those transferable skills. Um, particularly if you're applying to internships or, um, you know, that first job out of college, employers don't expect that you're going to have a lot of really relevant experience. But if you've got, you know, experience, um, if they're looking for communication skills and you worked in a restaurant or a uh, retail store, you have some really good communication skills from that that would transfer you know, be transferable to the things that they might be looking for in um, this position. So don't forget those transferable skills. And then you can organize this into a nice outline and take that with you to the interview or have it handy as you're doing your, um, your virtual interview. You don't want to be reading answers, but just having it handy to be able to glance down and just remind yourself, oh yes, that's the one I was going to talk about for that. That can be a helpful resource to have along with you. So questions about any of those pieces in terms of kind of assessing your skills and matching it up with the position you're interviewing for. All right, so let's move on um, to preparing questions to ask. So someone mentioned this at the very beginning, you always wanna have some smart, relevant questions ready to ask. So. Again, that research that you've done will help you to come up with some questions and you can ask questions. There's some examples here, but you can ask questions about the organization. You can ask questions about the position. You can ask questions about the interviewer. You know, what's your favorite thing about working in this organization? Or if you noticed that they had done some, you know, uh, written some articles on a certain topic or whatever that you're also interested in, you could ask them about that. So again, that research that you've done is really going to help you form 
formulate um, some, some good questions. You want to ask questions for things that you want to know the answer to. Don't just arbitrarily ask, you know, random questions um, for the sake of asking questions. It really should, this should help you. Remember, I talked about that two-way street at the beginning. This will help you assess whether this is a good position, this is a good organization for you. So use this as your opportunity to get some information that's helpful. Um, you may have some questions that are follow-up to things that they talked about earlier. Maybe they mentioned some things and you had some follow-up questions. This is a great time to do that. Have a notepad with you. You can jot down those questions as you're, you know, something comes to mind. Quickly just jot a quick note to yourself um, between other questions, and then you can come back to that and ask that question at the end. Um, you want to be sure that you're not asking questions they've already answered. So if you've prepared some questions ahead of time, some of your questions, particularly about the position or the organization, might have been great questions, but they've maybe already talked about it during the course of the interview. So you don't want to ask a question that they've already talked about. I mean, you certainly could ask a follow-up question or for more detail about that. That would be an appropriate way to do that. Um, as a rule of thumb, you typically want to ask two to three questions at the end of an interview. Um, if it's a much longer interview, maybe four, um, but much more than that, and it's going to seem like it's dragging it out too much for the interviewers, they're probably interviewing several people that day. Um, but if you don't have any questions or you only have one question, it does kind of seem like you're not as interested. So having two to three questions is really the good rule of thumb to actually ask two to three questions. But in order to have two or three questions to ask, you probably are going to want to prepare ahead of time, I would say, at least five to 10 questions. Because again, some of the questions you may have, they've already answered, or it might not seem as relevant once you get you know, to that point in the interview. So questions about that. All right. So Let's talk about practicing your elevator pitch. Um, and I think that um, Ashley talked about this in the networking workshop as well. It is really similar, but the reason it's important in an interview is that almost always they start an interview with a question that's something like, tell us about yourself. Um, some kind of basic question. It's designed to just help put you at ease and um, kind of get the interview started in a low stress um, way. So just know they're going to ask something like that at the beginning, and you can be prepared with that answer ready to go. So that's why you want to kind of plan ahead for that. It should be relatively short, um, you know, probably about 30 seconds. Um, it doesn't need to be a lot longer than that. Certainly no more than a minute in terms of this kind of first answer. Um, you want to stick to things that are relevant to the position. You don't need to be talking about your favorite baseball team or things like that. Um, it's a great idea to share something unique about yourself. So, you know, for example, if you are um, applying to, a, you know, a particular organization and you volunteered with that organization in high school, that might be something that's really relevant that makes you stand out. Um, one example, I had a student one time who was um, an accounting major and he was applying for some internships and he was volunteering to help do tax preparation um, for um, people who couldn't afford to hire people to do that. And I thought that was a great example. Like it, it made him stand out. It was relevant to his career. So those types of things can be a great, um, you know, kind of little piece to just throw in as part of this kind of tell us about yourself. Um, if there's anything that's a red flag, especially for students who might be non-traditional age students, if you've got gaps in your career, or if there were any other, you know, issues, if GPA was important and you've got a bad semester, you know, like some of those things that are obvious that they already know anyway, um, it's sometimes it's a good idea to just kind of address that positively up front as part of the this kind of opening. So that's something that you can um, do as well. Don't answer every question that they're going to ask um, in this first, you know, this first answer you want to um, just kind of whet their appetite, give a little quick overview. And you can practice it ahead of time. That's the great thing about this. You know this is likely going to be a question, so you can kind of practice it. Um, you don't want to sound completely rehearsed, but you can practice it enough that you're going to feel comfortable and be confident on that first answer. And then if you've done that, then as you keep going through the interview, if you've got one good one under your belt, it's going to make you more confident for the future questions. So 
questions about um, this or anything else kind of related to that first question? All right. So I want to talk about video interviews, um, a few tips because they, they're they becoming virtual interviews or video interviews are becoming much more common. Um, and of course, we're all getting pretty good at using Zoom or whatever is kind of our preferred platform. But a few tips ahead of time to kind of prepare if you're going to be doing a virtual interview or a video, um, either a live or recorded video. Pass the technology ahead of time. Every platform is different. Like if you're a UAlbany student, you're pretty good at Zoom now, but they might be using WebEx or something, another platform. So you want to test that platform ahead of time if possible. Um, typically, working, um, doing an interview on a computer is a better choice than a tablet or a phone. You're going to get a better camera. You, um, it's easier to, um, you know, sit the situation up and to be able to see all of the other interviewers, things like that. Um, write down the login information. Don't re just don't rely on that link that you've got in your, you know, computer or your phone. You never know what you know, last minute glitch is going to happen with your email. So you want to be sure you've got the login information in a couple of places so that you can easily access it. Um, secure the connection. If you live with other people, you know, ask others to not be on Wi-Fi while you're doing the interview so that you've got, as um, you know, uh, a, as good a connection as you can possibly get. Make sure you're, you know, everything's charged, plugged in, all of those things. And if you can do a practice run on that platform with a friend, that can be really helpful. Um, so those are some kind of technology tips. A couple of other things in terms of setup. And again, you've probably gotten used to this um, with classes, but so often when you're in classes online or just attending a workshop like this, you don't necessarily need to have your camera on. You do need to have your camera on if you're doing a virtual interview. So you want to be sure that your background is um, is nice. You can use a virtual background like I'm using here, picture of the campus, that's certainly an option. Or like Leslie is sitting in an office. Um, if I were gonna do an interview, I'd probably clean up the background behind where Leslie's sitting. It's just the office she works in is not her job to clean the office. But if you were doing this in your own, you know, your own home or you're finding someplace, you want a nice, you know, kind of clutter-free background. Um, you want a quiet place, um, well-lit space. Make sure you don't have like a glaring light coming in from a window on one side or worse yet from behind you. If it's backlit, then your face gets dark. So you want to kind of test that ahead of time at the time of day that you're going to be doing the interview to just make sure that the the lighting is going to work and minimize the distractions. If you have pets or family members or roommates or things like that, let them know you're doing an interview and ask them to maybe, you know, leave or be in another room or whatever during that time so that you can, um, you know, make your best impression. So any questions about um, virtual interviews, video tips, things like that? Okay, so that's kind of the preparation part. So now let's move into during the actual interview. Um, some tips for during the interview. We're going to talk about dressing professionally, arriving early, um, different types of questions that you could be asked, some common interview questions, the STAR technique, which is a great um, strategy for answering questions, and then nonverbal communication. So talk about all of those next. So dressing professionally, again, depending upon the type of position it is, um, if it's a, a full-time job, if it's an internship, um, what the field is, um, you do want to dress professionally. Um, you do want to dress typically conservatively. Um, if you're applying to government positions, banks, places like that, definitely more conservative than if you were applying to, you know, a preschool. Um, you know, there's different fields have kind of different standards and norms. But um, for um, a particularly a full-time position, you probably are going to want to wear a suit. Um, or a full-time internship, I'd also probably wear a suit. And it's never wrong to wear a suit to an interview. So you can always err on the side of being overdressed is better than being too casual. Um, the more conservative um, colors, black, gray, navy. I'm wearing, you know, like a hot pink one right now with plaid. So again, depending upon where you're interviewing, I work in education and higher education. This is a perfectly appropriate professional attire for something like that. If I were applying to a bank or maybe with the state department, I might pull out a black or a navy um, jacket instead. 
um, you know, professional shoes, conservative tie. Um, you want to, you know, be sure that your accessories are um, simple, not overly distracting, um, no heavy perfumes or colognes, natural makeup, conservative nail polish, all of those things. And it's a, not that you don't want to show your personality, but you want to, you know, a little personality showing through is great, but you also want to be sure that you're, you're looking professional and dressed. Typically the rule of thumb is the type of the, the, what, what is likely the attire for the position you're applying for. You want to be dressing at that level or maybe even one step more professionally from that. Um, again, if in person, don't smoke or chew gum, freshen your breath, you know, with some, uh, you know, some gum quickly or a mint beforehand, and then get rid of the gum um, when you go into the interview. And um, for those of you who are current students, both grad and undergrad, don't forget about purple threads. If you're not aware of purple threads, that is a um, clothing closet, professional clothing closet for U Albany students. It's located in the campus center and you can go on their website to find out their hours, but you can go every semester and get a suit or three items um, each semester. So that's a great opportunity and you should start, you know, building your professional wardrobe. Don't wait till you have an interview, go every semester and get something. Um, they're free. It's this like free clothing um, that are donated by, sometimes it's donated by um, faculty or staff or community members. Sometimes it's donated by stores, but there's a lot of great options there in terms of um, kind of building your professional wardrobe. And I do want to just say a little bit about um, video interviews. If you're doing a virtual interview on video, you do want to also be dressed professionally. All of these, I mean, probably no one cares about freshening your breath on a video, but most all the rest of these would definitely apply. And here's the thing. Don't just, I know we all dress from, you know, waist up when we're doing video, but here's the thing on an interview, you would hate to accidentally spill your glass of water and quickly have to stand up or something happen and you quickly stand up and you're wearing your boxer shorts or your sweatpants or something like that. So for an interview, you don't have to do it for class, no one cares. But for an interview, I would definitely be sure that you're dressed professionally head to toe, um, even if you're on a virtual one. So any questions about professional attire or dressing for an interview? All right. The other, um, the next important thing, be sure to arrive early. You always want to arrive, um, arrive if it's an in-person or log in 10 to 15 minutes early. I will tell you that if you're going there to an interview or you're logging in, I wouldn't log in more or arrive more than 15 minutes early. If you, you know, are driving someplace you've never been before and you get there a half an hour early, that's perfectly fine. Find a nearby park bench, sit in your car, do something until it's 15 minutes before and then go in. Um, there's something about being too eager. It catches them off guard. They're not ready for you yet. There might be other candidates there. So the window to arrive is 10 to 15 minutes early, whether you're logging in um, or arriving in person. Um, you can bring a couple of extra copies of your resume. Um, if you've prepared, you know, lists of questions, you're kind of like, um, that little outline we talked about, a notebook, a pen, you can have it in a nice portfolio. You want it to look professional, um, but having um, those things in a nice, you know, kind of notebook portfolio type thing is a great thing to do. If you're showing up in person, if you're online, you can have those things handy. You want to just be sure that even if you're online, you don't look like you're reading them. You can glance down at them occasionally, but you want to be sure that you are still prepared and not looking because they can tell if you're reading your notes on a virtual interview. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the other reasons to have a notebook and a pen is it's handy to write down the names of the interviewers. So if you didn't know who they were ahead of time and as they introduced themselves, or sometimes there was a change from who you expected, jot down their names so that you can call them by name is a really um, great tip for interviewing as well. You want to be, you know, professional, personable, try to make a connection. So some of that small talk that happens before an interview starts, all of that's really important. And sometimes having done some research on your interviewers can help you with that part of it as well. Now, as you're going through, I, I think one of the best tips that I've ever received about interviewing is that you don't have to blurt out your answer right away. So they ask you a question, take a minute and um, 
compose your thoughts. And so you can pause and you can just think about how to formulate your answer. And then, you know, what, which of my examples that I had planned on would be a good, a good answer for this. And then you can, you know, kind of formulate how to start and then start answering. It's perfectly okay. If you need a little more time, you can also use some fillers like that's a great question. Um, or let me think about that. Things like that can just fill a few seconds to give you a little more time to think. I'm asking them to repeat the question. You can, especially if you were any, you know, had any questions about what exactly they said, definitely ask them to repeat the question. Um, that's perfectly fine to do. You just pause for, you know, a little bit of silence. It's going to seem like it's an eternity of silence to you. It's really probably going to only be a short time. Now, the one little tip I will say is don't, don't pick your favorite answer and do that on every single one. So don't say, let me think about that on every single question. Mix it up, sometimes just pause, occasionally say one of these things. You want it to seem natural and not like a whole rehearsed thing. So questions about any of those tips? All right, so let's talk a little bit about the types of interview questions. Um, there's there's a number of different types of questions that you could be asked. Um, Skill-based questions often are related to different tools or technology. That's going to vary by industry. There might be some computer programs. They might ask about your Excel skills or different software programs that are common in your field or if there's other you know tools or technology that is relevant to the, the position. They may ask some specific skills-based questions about you know times you've used that or your familiarity with those types of things. Um, behavioral questions, um, really, these are things more that get at some of those soft skills like trustworthiness, um, attitude, work ethic, things like that. So they um, they're typically um, based on past experience, and when they're asking that question, they're going to want you to give an example of a time that you did that. And then situational questions, they they almost seem like well, like a scenario, like, for example, you know, if you if you were presented with this situation, how would you handle it? It's a situational question. So you're supposed to kind of think about what your you know, they want to see what your instincts are, what your decision making abilities, things like that. But in most of those cases, and we're going to talk more about this when we talk about the star technique, but um, you can say I would do this. Um, and then give an example of a time you've done that in the past. So with all three of these, you know, first ones, giving an example is really the best way to go of a time that you did it in the past. And then the other thing to be aware of is open-ended versus closed-ended questions. And open-ended questions are questions that start with like how and why, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of tell a story. Um, Closed-ended questions are basically yes-no questions, like are or do, if it starts with are or do, that's such closed-ended question. And here's the thing, they may ask the question as a yes-no question, but they don't want just a yes or no as your answer. So even if they say, are you willing to da da da, -da or do you have experience doing this, don't just say yes or no you want to then still follow up with an example. Um, it's, it's, they should have asked the question better, but just because they asked the question poorly does not mean they don't want a full answer. So make sense, questions? All right, so let's talk what some of the common questions. So we already talked about that first, the likely first question you're gonna get, tell me about yourself. But there's a lot of other questions that are commonly asked. And I think one that many people struggle with is the strengths and weaknesses question. Like, tell me about your strengths or what's one strength and one weakness. Um, and that can be a hard question. One, people don't like to brag about themselves. They feel uncomfortable bragging about themselves. And then on the other hand, they don't want to bring up negative things about themselves. It seems counterintuitive in an interview. But here's the thing about um, these, they really want to see what you view as your strengths. Like what are, you know, what do you, what do you bring to the table that would be an asset for them? So you want to, and again, give an example of, you know, talk about what your strength is and give an example of, you know, how you have used that strength in a work setting or a classroom setting or something like that. From the weakness standpoint, let's be honest, no one's perfect, we're none perfect, and they want to 
know that you know you're not perfect and you are self-aware enough to know what some of your weaknesses are and things that you might be um, working on improving. A couple of rules of thumb about the weakness question. One, it's sh don't answer something that's a critical job skill. So if it's an uh, internship in a legislative office and, and you're going to be spending most of your time answering the phone and talking to constituents, the, you don't want to say that one of your weaknesses is you're afraid to talk on the phone. Um, I will say that if that really is a weakness and it's a major job criteria, maybe this isn't the best job for you and you might want to look at other jobs to apply for. But you don't want to share a weakness that's a critical job skill. But you do want to share a real, a real weakness. Um, one of my pet peeves is when people say that their weakness is they're a perfectionist, because that's really kind of just an underhanded way of saying I'm so perfect, I don't have any weaknesses. So I think you want to, you know, think about something that really is a weakness, but it's also something you're working on. So you can share what it is. Um, you know, I struggle with balancing, you know, multiple priorities. Um, and then give an example. Last semester, I was, you know, taking, you know, six classes, which is more than I normally take. And I was president of this organization. And I was also doing an internship. And I really, um, it really, you know, became challenging. And, you know, this is something I still struggle with, but I've been working on and then talk about how you're working on it. I got a planner, and I was identifying, you know, the priorities for each week and making to do lists. And that has really helped me to get um, better at that. So that's how you want to answer that strength weakness question. So questions about other questions about that? All right. So another common question is um, describe a difficult work situation or a project or how you overcame it. So they want, they're really looking for um, your perseverance, how you deal with challenges. And again, you want to give an example of something, a time when you had a struggle or a challenge. It could be a work situation. It could have been a class situation um, and then how you overcame it. So you want to talk about just a little bit about the situation. Don't dwell on how terrible it was, but give the context of the situation and then to go into more detail about how you overcame it, persevered, what things you did, what strategies you used to overcome that. All right. Um, how do you handle stress or pressure? Um, the, this is, you know, a, I think com a common question, especially for interview or internships, um, because they know students are managing a lot of different things while they're doing an internship. So you can't just say I'm great at managing stress. You want to give some examples. Um, tell them you make lists. Again, how do you organize your time? Give some specific examples. Do you like to go running to let off steam? You know, what is it that you do to um, to actually do that? Um, sometimes they might ask you questions about interacting with difficult people or, you know, have you had to manage difficult personalities in the past? This is not a good opportunity to bad mouth your current boss or former colleagues. Um, but again, you could just in context, say I had a former coworker who, you know, and then you can give a little detail. But again, you want to talk about how you handled that situation. What did you do to try to make the situation better? So questions. Um, this next question is something about flexibility, dealing with change. I mean, the world is always changing. And I think that's something that employers are often looking for. In this particular example, are you know, are you flexible enough to handle this kind of changing environment? Again, this is an example of what I was talking about where they asked a yes, no question. The answer is not just yes or no. Um, you want to say, yes, I, uh, you know, I pride myself on my flexibility and then give an example of a time that you, you know, dealt with change or had to be flexible in um, a particular project or task. Um, this one, I not a lot of employers will ask this, but there are other ways to say it. They're probably not going to just blatantly say you don't have a lot of work experience, but sometimes they will ask questions that kind of hint at you don't have a lot of experience and it kind of is a setup. And the thing is, you don't want to get defensive. You want to then, you know, think about those transferable skills that you did prepared for and give some examples of how you have the transferable skills that would be relevant to this position. Um, 
Another common question, where do you see yourself in five years or 10 years? There's a lot of different ways to ask that question. Um, no one expects you to know 100% what you want to do. But people are looking for employees or interns who have a sense of their, you know, direction, what their career goals are, ultimately, um, how this position or internship fits in with your career goals. Um, so to give a little bit of information, you may, you know, you may not know if you want to work in a nonprofit or you want to work in a government agency five years from now, but you do know that you're really interested in environmental issues. So you can talk about that and say, you know, I'm flexible about, you know, the sector that I work in, but I really have, you know, become passionate about environmental issues. And so I do see myself, you know, in the next five to 10 years, continuing to work to improve environmental issues and give a little more detail about that. So um, it's one of those questions you don't have to know exactly what you're going to do, but it is helpful to kind of have some direction that you can share with them. And then this last one, um, why should we hire you or what did we not tell what, you know, what's, how would you sum up your candidacy or what else do you want to tell us that we didn't already ask you about? This is usually comes near the end and it's kind of your chance to summarize the main points from the interview. You can reiterate something that you think is really important that you wanted to, you know, um, uh, kind of summarize and make a nice, powerful statement. You can bring up something that you didn't get a chance to share that you think is really relevant. And you, it's kind of, think of it as that summary, it's that closing statement, and you're going to really kind of summarize why you're the best candidate. I would be a little prepared for this one ahead of time too. You know this, something like this is going to come and you can't have it completely memorized because you don't know what else you'll have already said during the interview, but, you know, kind of have an idea about what your kind of key points are in terms of the skills that you really want to emphasize related to this position. So any questions about any of those um, common interview questions? All right. So let's talk a little bit about the STAR technique. Um, if you've um, talked about or you know written cover letters or attended any of our cover letter workshops in the past, we often talk about the START technique, which has an extra T at the end. It's very similar in an interview. The, the la last T is less important um, because you're answering a specific question, but the STAR, the S-T-A-R stand for the same exact things. It's really, it's a, it's a technique that helps you formulate an answer to a question just like it helps you formulate a paragraph for your cover letter. Um, you start with the situation, the kind of the scenario or background. The T stands for what you did, the task. A for the action, how you did it. And then R is the result, what was the outcome. And um, the, the real benefit, I think, to this in terms of interviews is that it helps you formulate your answer, give a specific example, which is always the best answer in almost all interview questions. You want to give a specific example of a time you did that. And this helps you structure it so that you don't keep rambling on and on. So you can, you know, in my blank, blank internship, I, you know, researched, um, I'm on environmental things. I, you know, knew, um, uh, alternative energy um, sources relevant to Albany County or whatever it might have been. Um, and then the action, how you did it. Um, and this is where even in a cover letter, you go into a little more detail on an interview. This is where you really want to go into more detail. You want to describe step by step how you did it, what you learned from it. Uh, and I don't mean what, what you gained in terms of your skills, but what you learned as a result of the research that impacted the decision for the, you know, legislative office or whoever you were, you know, doing this wherever you were working or whatever this was in relation to. Um, and then the result, like then where, how was this information used? Um, what did it benefit the organization? What did you accomplish as this? And I think the other biggest difference in terms of this technique in an interview the first thing is you're probably going to go into even more detail and more specifics than you did in a cover letter. The other thing is in an interview, you can really let your passion show through. So your enthusiasm and your excitement and how much you, you know, loved working on this project, 
it's not really appropriate to say things like that in a cover letter, but in an interview, you can really kind of let that passion show through and as you're describing this task or project or whatever you are working on. So questions about the STAR technique. But really for almost all questions in an interview, it really is gonna be your friend and help you to um, you know, get a nice concise answer without rambling on forever and ever. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of actual in your interviews is um, nonverbal communication. This is so important. And again, really in-person, virtual or phone, there's nonverbal things to keep in mind. Um, in person and virtual, that eye contact, making eye contact, looking at people directly. If you are nervous and it's hard to look at people directly in the in the um, face in an interview, look at a spot on the wall just behind their head. It's going to look like you're looking at them, even if you're not. Um, I mean, if you're comfortable doing, you know, actually looking them in the eye, do that. But if not, that's kind of a trick that you could use. If you're on virtual, you want to be sure you're looking at the camera. Don't be looking off to the side. And a little trick that I, some two little tricks that I sometimes do, if you can't remember where the camera is on your device, take a post-it note and make a little arrow and stick it there so you know exactly where the camera is and it'll remind you to look at it. Maybe even write smile underneath um, the arrow to remind you to smile. Um, the other thing that I do sometimes too is I have this habit of looking at myself. I, it's it's hard not to, um, you know, like, so whatever you look at, if you were looking at the other person, move the people's faces around, the Brady Bunch squares around to get whoever you want to look at closest to the camera. And it will help you keep an eye on the camera because your natural tendency is going to go on if you look at the person you're talking to. And if you move their Brady Bunch square up close to the camera, it's going to look like you're looking at the camera. Um, a firm handshake if you're in person is an important thing. Um, good posture, and that's important on video as well. Um, smile, and always smile. I mean, you don't wanna have a silly grin on your face the whole entire time, but you want to be sure that you're periodically smiling and you know, um, looks like you're enjoying the interview. I know you're gonna be stressed and not being enjoying the interview, you have to look like you're enjoying the interview. And I will say that even on a phone interview, smiling is really important. Um, because you can hear a smile in someone's voice. Um, you may not know it, but you really can. So on a phone interview, definitely give yourself a post-it note that says smile to remind yourself to smile because there's no face to look at and no one else is going to smile back at you and you're going to forget to do it. You want to speak um, clearly, slowly, articulate well, um, especially if you're like me and your natural tendency is to talk really fast, <laughs> or if you speak softly or with an accent, you want to be sure that you're particularly conscientious about articulating so that they can um, understand you well. And that's even more important if you're on video or phone, because the technology can sometimes get in the way and make that more difficult. So you always want to be sure to do that. Um, don't fidget. I've got a pen in my hand. I play with a pen all the time. That's fine <laughs> when you're in class, but not so fine when you're at an interview. So if you play with your pen, have the pen and lay it down and don't hold it in your hand. Um, if you play with your hair, I'm a, you know, I've had long hair, I fidget with my hair, whatever it is. If you have any, you know, um, nervous habits or tics, or you say, um, 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 a lot, like just think about those things, um, notice that, and then try to eliminate those things or to kind of reduce them so that those nonverbal communications don't get in the way. You want your nonverbal communication to help enhance your message, not to be distracting from your message. So any questions about that? All right, so a couple of quick tips for after the interview. Um, we're going to assess your interview performance, evaluate the position, send a thank you note, um, wait, the hardest part, um, possibly do some follow-up and hopefully accept a job interview or job offer. So let's talk about that. The first thing you want to do um, after the interview is over and you're back home and you're like got in your comfy clothes again, is you want to think about how you did on the interview. And this is not going to be the last interview you have. So note your strengths and weaknesses. What did you do well? What could you improve next time? Um, what questions did you have trouble answering? Um, and you can like get some help. Um, do some you know, research, talk to a career counselor um, about ways to better prepare um, and practice answers to those questions. 
learn from your experience, but don't dwell on your mistakes um, and think about how you can prepare differently. So everybody's going to have done some things well and some things poorly in any interview. It's just human nature. But again, you want to use this as an opportunity. Assess how you did, learn from your mistakes, but don't dwell on it. Don't, you know, like yell at yourself and do all of that. Just like you did your best at the time, learn from it so you can do better the next time. You probably did better than you think. We usually are hardest on ourselves. So that's the first thing, assessing the your interview performance. The next thing you want to do is evaluate the position. Um, you know, now you've got some more information. They gave you information. Hopefully you asked some good questions. Um, is this in position still something that's interested, interesting to you? Do you still want to do that? Um, want the job or the internship? Do you like the organization? Do you feel that you could perform the job duties that they're looking for? And really evaluate whether this is a position that you're interested in or not. And then, you know, you know, if they offer you a position, but you're really not interested in, then, you know, you know, that maybe the best choice is to decline the position. Um, or if, you know, you're really interested, you, even if you don't get the position, if you get the position, great, you're good to go. If you don't, now, you know, oh, but similar position, other positions similar to this might be the types of things I should be looking for um, as you kind of continue your job search. So, because again, it's a two-way street. They're evaluating you, but you're evaluating the position in them as well. So questions about that. The other important thing, send a thank you note. Um, an email is the typical way um, to send a thank you note within 24 hours is ideal. Um, if you don't you know, get a chance to do it, you can still do it later than that. But really that's kind of the rule of thumb to send a thank you note within 24 hours. And like I said, email is pretty standard for how to do that. You want to express your pre appreciation for the interview, thank them for their time, reiterate your interest in the position, assuming you are still interested in the position, the organization, the company, whatever. Um, maybe re remind them of a particular relevant skills, um, kind of, you know, summarize a couple of key skills again that you think are particularly relevant for the position. And then if there's things that didn't get covered in the interview that you thought of afterwards, like, oh, I wish I would have said this. You could also work that into the thank you note as well. Another example of some, you know, experience I have that I didn't get a chance to share in the interview, but I just wanted to, you know, um, share with you now kind of thing. So send a nice thank you note. It doesn't have to be super long, a couple of paragraphs, um, send it by email. Um, if you interviewed with multiple people, um, I actually think it shows a little more um, initiative to send a separate email to each person. Uh, assuming you can get their email addresses. Sometimes you may not have all the contact information and you only have one and you have to send it to that person. Though with the internet now, you can actually find most people's email addresses on their company website. But if you can't, um, you can always just send, send a thank you email to the person that you, you know, have the contact information for and then, you know, ask them to share that with the other uh, members of the interview committee. So thank you note, key. Not everyone does it and it really does make you stand out if you do. Um, everyone should, but not everyone does. So be that person. Then the hardest part, waiting. Um, but there's no way to avoid it. I mean, in very, very few situations will you get an answer at the interview or even within 24 hours after the interview. In most cases, there's going to be days, if not weeks, while you're waiting, while um, they're interviewing other people or making decisions or finalizing the budget or whatever it is that they're doing related to it. Um, but what can you do while you're waiting? Keep looking for other positions. Like don't count on this one. Don't put all of the eggs in one basket, as my mother would say. Um, you want to keep looking for other positions and continue your, you know, job search. Um, and you can always talk with a friend or an advisor or someone in the career staff. If you start panicking, we're here to kind of help you through this whole process. Um, and then follow up. So um, sometimes it is helpful to follow up. You're going to want, you know, wait to hear one question that you can ask. They may tell you. And if they don't, you can certainly ask near the end of the interview is, you know, when will you be making a decision or when could I expect to hear? Um, and then that will help guide you as to when you could do follow up. If they said you'd hear in two weeks, don't email them two weeks and one minute later, um, maybe wait three weeks. Cause you know, sometimes things take longer, but if they said you'd hear in two weeks and you haven't heard in three weeks, then I would, then I think three weeks is an appropriate time to do a follow-up. 
Um, if they didn't say, then typically a couple of weeks is probably the window in which you would do a follow-up. And how you would follow up, send a brief email thanking them again for the interview, reiterating your interest in the position and asking about the status of the, uh, you can ask the status of my application or the status of their selection process. Either of those kind of lines works to just kind of find out. I mean, it's very possible um, that you were not the top candidate and they've got an offer out to somebody else, but they're waiting to hear and you might be the second candidate. And if that person turns it down, you might be the next one they contact. So you want to be very professional. Don't be pushy. Don't be panicky. Don't be, you know, any, um, you know, sound desperate. You just a nice professional email. And again, in the interviewing handbook, there's samples of those types of emails and someone on our staff is always happy to review them if you have questions or want someone to take a look at it before you send it off. Um, and then hopefully if you get an offer, um, you know, couple of things to keep in mind, you don't have to accept it on the spot. Most offers come in email now, but if they call you to offer it, you do not, at a full-time job, they may call. That's actually probably more common um, in a full-time job interview internships are likely to be an email, but you do not have to respond immediately or answer them on the spot. It's perfectly appropriate to ask for some time to review the offer, especially with full-time jobs. It's perfectly appropriate to ask for the offer in writing, um, you know, so that they'll send you that. Um, and then you can evaluate the offer. You may have some other things that you're also interviewing for that you want to balance. So, um, you know, you can take a little time. Now, typically, you can't take a long time. Um, they're going to want an answer usually within a two or three days. Um, sometimes they might say, the email may say, please, you know, how do you respond and accept this offer by Friday? You know, if you need a little more time, it's appropriate to ask for an extra day or two, but I wouldn't ask maybe two or three days. I wouldn't ask for much more than that. Um, and again, someone on our staff can help you if you get in that kind of situation. Um, there certainly are some things you can do in terms of negotiating um, the offer, the salary, things like that. We do a whole separate workshop on that, which is on our YouTube channel, and we'll be doing it again in the spring. Um, but you do want to, you do need to give them a decision. So if you're declining, if you decided it's not the right position for you, or if you've got another position that you're taking instead, you should do that as soon as possible. Um, because again, they need to make a decision. There's other people waiting to hear. So um, definitely do that as soon as possible. Um, if you're waiting to hear about other offers, you can be honest and just say, you know, I've, I've had a couple of other interviews. I'm waiting to hear. Um, is it possible to get an extra couple of days to make a decision? Um, and just know that accepting a job, um, even an internship, but particularly a full-time job is a serious commitment. And it's it's generally unacceptable to reverse that decision. And um, the world of work, particularly in Albany, is a small place and you don't want to be burning those bridges. So, all right. I know we're coming up on our hour. So I wanted just a couple of last few little tips. Um, a couple of interview don'ts. Don't ask about money in the first interview. That's typically not considered appropriate unless they bring it up first. Um, don't talk negatively about um, previous employers. That's going to just reflect on you, not necessarily your previous employer. Don't share too much information, not personal information, things like that. You want to be focused on professional things. Um, don't let yourself get rattled. I know it's easier said than done. And then most importantly, don't exaggerate or lie. It's going to come back to bite you. Just like we say that on a resume or a cover letter, you don't want to do it in an interview either. So I do want to share um, a little bit about Big Interview, which is a great um, platform that all you Albany students can access. And the website is there. You can log in with um, your single sign-on. You can access it through the Career Services um, website, the link to it if you forget what it is. It's called Big Interview. And there's um, you can do practice interviews and you record yourself, kind of like I talked about those recorded interviews, which are an uncommon type of interview. This actually is the similar model where a recorded person will read an interview question to you and then you'll record yourself answering it. And you can do it on your computer, laptop, tablet, um, computer, laptop, tablet, or phone, sorry. Um, repeated myself there, um, and then watch it again later. Um, some of us actually use it as a, um, assignments in some of our uh, career classes. So it's a great um, way to do some practice and just kind of see how you do um, and uh, get some practice on different types of questions. There's industry-specific questions in there. Um, 
And there's also little tips, like if you have lots of short little like training videos on different types of questions or different things like that. So if there's things you struggle with, you can find that to be a great resource as well. So any final questions um, about anything we talked about? And uh, Leslie, any that have come in the chat while we were going through? Uh, no questions in the chat. All right, while you guys are thinking and typing in any final questions, I just wanna share a few more reminders about some other resources. Um, our career handbooks, we've got one on interviewing, um, but we've got them on a variety of topics. You can pick those up in our office and you can also um, get them, access them from our website. Um, the We have a virtual career series on YouTube um, of all the, um, not all, but many of the workshops that Rockefeller has done um, in the last few years that were recorded and you can access those anytime. This will go up there um, later this semester as well, but there's other workshops from other topics as well that I encourage you to, um, to check out. Uh, our website, uh, both the Rockefeller College Career website and the Career and Professional Development, which is the main uh, career office for the campus for students in any major. Um, there's lots of resources and handbooks and things like that located on those websites. And I've got both of those websites there. Handshake is a great resource. Most of you know about it. Upcoming career events, um, you schedule appointments, search for jobs and internships, things like that. And then our Rock Your Career newsletter for students who are political science, public policy, and criminal justice majors, both grad and undergrad. It's our weekly newsletter that has lots of career information and posting. And some of you, um, your other academic departments, if you're of a different major, may have similar type things where they're sharing um, job postings and things like that. The main career office also sends out um, newsletters and things like that. And I have both the Rockefeller Career Office. Again, primarily we work with political science, public policy, and criminal justice students. There's our contact information. We've got office on both downtown and uptown campus and all of our contact information. You can schedule an appointment through your handshake, stop by our office hours, um, and be sure to watch, uh, read that Rock Your Careers email each week. And for students in other majors, um, the main career office is in the science library. You're welcome to access them. They have a so, range of similar services. They schedule appointments through the EAB system that says student success if you go into My Albany. And then there are other departments. Your department may have a career office as well. Um, EHC, business, um, public health, um, definitely have people and some other smaller departments also have faculty members or staff people who part of their job is helping students with career issues or internships. So be sure to utilize those um, resources as well. So any last questions that came into the chat while I was wrapping up? Oop. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, thank you, Leslie, for helping to manage the chat and the waiting room for us. And um, feel free to reach out to our office um, if you've got additional questions about interviewing or anything else. And uh, thank you to those who are watching the recording as well. Have a great day.